Hi, my name's Gareth Locke from The Human Diver. I've been running these human factors or non-technical skills programs since January 2016. They're a mixture of online and face-to-face -face programs with the aim of improving the performance and safety of the divers that are out there. It's aimed at any diver, but really those who take greater risks. Instructors, cave divers, rebreather divers, technical divers, because we need to understand how we make the failures that we do and what we can do to prevent those or predict them and go from that. Human factor for me is, uh, is uh, food for instructors and brain training. For me, the human factors in diving course is all about personal development and working in a team. So what I will change is uh, have more briefings and more debriefs. For me, human factors training uh, the last two days were uh, team performance and mind-blowing. This course changes that perception from stop making mistakes to what to improve and how to do it. All right, so welcome Dive Nation. How's it going? Gareth, welcome uh, yet again. Uh, looking forward to uh, the webinar this evening. Uh, I see we've got a handful of folks uh, that have already joined. So I'll uh, kickstart the webinar with a couple of introduction slides uh, while we wait for more folks to join. And um, yeah, I'll just uh, get cracking um, pretty much now. So just give me a sec to get myself organized here. Um, Great to see everybody. Okay. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. No, no, it's great really? to have you on board. It's great to have you on board as usual. I'm looking forward to it. And I hope every, uh, everybody else is, you know. So uh, it's great to have you guys uh, join yet another Supercharged Dan webinar. Uh, for those folks that don't know, uh, don't, don't know me, my name is Mornay, and I'll be your host this evening. And I'm also the CEO of Dan Southern Africa. And, uh, yeah, just thank you for making the time to join yet another webinar. And thank you for supporting Divers Alert Network. Now, the talk topic this evening is setting and maintaining goals for divers. And more about that in a couple of slides and obviously when Gareth uh, presents his talk. Um, just a couple of webinar basics and things to know. Uh, your video and mic is turned off as usual. And this really is just to ensure that there are no unexpected uh, scenes or noises during the presentation. And now over to you, uh, Dive Nation. Uh, please use the comments box and introduce yourself. Tell us where you are in the world and uh, let us know what you're expecting from the webinar. Now, I'm sure you'll have questions during the, um, the, the talk or the presentation. Please use the, the comments box again, but uh, use hashtag ask and then uh, type out your question. That just helps us uh, identify the question uh, questions amongst the uh, general um, comments that are left uh, in the comments box. Now, as usual, the webinar replay will be available via the Dan Southern Africa YouTube channel uh, tomorrow, and uh, you'll also receive... Um, a follow-up email with a replay link uh, and in that uh, email there'll be a bunch of free resources so keep a look out for uh, that webinar now again just thank you for supporting divers alert network um, if you haven't joined why not join today if you're in the southern africa region you can go to our website it's danesa.org uh, if you're in the united states and canada area you can go to dan.org uh, within the European region, it's just daneurope.org. And if you find yourself in Asia Pacific, it's danap.org. Now, to all the Active Dan members, thank you for your ongoing support. And if anybody would like help us uh, sort of grow our um, YouTube channel, um, you're more than welcome to donate via the Super Chat uh, YouTube feature. You'll find it on YouTube. And if you do donate, it bumps you up to the top so everybody can see um, that you're supporting us. Now, just a couple of uh, uh, resources from uh, Gareth's side. You can see he's got a great uh, number of courses if you go onto his website. But this one in particular is the Human Factors in Diving, the Essentials Micro Class. It's really a great program. Uh, if you haven't uh, completed it yet, you can scan that QR code and it'll take you to his landing page. And there you can view 
um, you know, what the course is about. And um, yeah, I would really recommend that you actually purchase that. The investment is worth it and you'll learn a lot. Now, you can just scan that code and it'll take you to that uh, website where you can uh, learn more about it. Uh, for the folks that haven't joined or if you're struggling with that QR code, I'll make this slide available at the end of the webinar again. Now, one last uh, resource from uh, Gareth Thad is his book, and I'm sure he'll be talking about it. Um, I've recently finished reading it. It's really a great resource, uh, jam-packed with case studies and things uh, to learn from uh, all the uh, people and expeditions and experiences he mentions and uh, mentions in the book. So once again, you can scan that QR code and it'll take you straight to uh, his website where you can read about the book. In fact, you can purchase it right there. This is really, I would say, as a diver, must have. So make sure that uh, you purchase that and uh, make it part of your uh, diving goodie bag. Uh, the book's called Under Pressure, Diving Deeper with Human Factors. And I'll make this available again towards the um, the end of the uh, presentation. Now, obviously, from a Dan perspective, it'll be great if you guys can follow us on our social media platforms. Simply scan that code there. It'll take you to a little landing page and it'll give you access to our website and all our uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook uh, handles uh, to, you know, so you can stay up to date with all the information that we uh, share pretty much on a daily basis. But more importantly, we are on YouTube now, so it'll be great if uh, you can hit that subscribe button to help us grow our content and share uh, everything that we uh, produce with more divers. And make sure to hit that reminder button uh, so that you can get uh, reminded uh, w whenever we release new content. And by the way, we release a, a video every week on a Wednesday. So keep a lookout for those. Anyways, I'll make this available also towards the end of the presentation. So let's meet our guest speaker, the one and only Gareth uh, Locke. So uh, who is Gareth? Well, he has been involved in high-risk work since 1989. Uh, he spent 25 years in the Royal Air Force in a variety of frontline operations, research and development, and system engineering roles, which has given him a unique perspective. And in 2005, he started uh, um, his dive training with GUI and is now an advanced trimix diver and a JJCCR uh, normoxic trimix diver. And in 2016, he formed the Human Diver uh, with a goal to bring um, his operational human factors and systems thinking to diving safety. Now, since then, he's trained more than 350 people face to face around the globe, taught nearly 2,000 people via online programs, sold more than 4,000 copies of his book that we just spoke about, Under Pressure, Diving Deeper with Human Factors. And he even produced, if only, a documentary about a fatal dive told through the lens of human factors and a just culture. Now, if you read his book, he speaks a lot about that there, so make sure to check it out. And uh, his, goal bring, his goal is to really bring human factors, practice, and knowledge into the diving community to improve safety, performance, and enjoyment. All right, before I hand over to Gareth, just a quick uh, talk topic overview. Uh, again, setting and maintaining goals for divers. Now, setting goals uh, enables us to do many amazing things, but at the same time, this focus can lead us to tragedy. As such, uh, an awareness of uh, the factors which shape and influence our decision-making is vital if we are to uh, intentionally succeed more often than we succeed through luck or fail in our endeavors. Now, this webinar will give you an insight into uh, the two sides of the same coin and how you can improve your odds of successful outcomes in our underwater world. Okay, well, with that said, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Gareth. I'm really supercharged. I'm uh, looking forward to the uh, presentation. So let's get started. I'll just uh, stop sharing uh, my slides and then I'll hand over to Gareth. There we go. Okay, Gareth. Oh, uh, I'm <laughs> With what you said, it's like, oh, I'm just, I'm just me. But um, <laughs> yes, I'm, uh, I'm bringing a, a unique perspective to the, to the diving industry, and sometimes a perspective that is is quite hard to get across. Sometimes uh, I often say that you know, human factors is is general in nature and specific in application, and and by that, it's this bit where we really have to look at the detail and why the case studies and 
and the context rich stories are so important and in fact more than I were, were just talking beforehand um, that when we look at incident reports and the stuff that gets published often it's it's really quite short in terms of narrative yeah. and uh, and we don't understand the, the sort of the real detail that the, the stuff that makes up this thing called local rationality how does it make sense for people to do what they did and and that's really what the, the premise of this just culture and psychological safety and that we, we will have another presentation on that in in a few months yeah. time and, and this is going to be a regular session uh, with Dan South Africa. So, you know, thank you very much for, for this ability. Um, so so tonight is is about goal setting. And it's it's such a huge topic because goals can be such a small thing, but they can also be quite large. And what we've got to be really aware of is potentially what are we getting ourselves into and how much commitment there is. So my the presentation this evening, um, I really, I, I'm looking for some engagement from you as the audience, because what I found through my own training um, is the real value is your reflection on what I present. Um, so what are your takeaways from this? And, and that ability to listen to my story, to listen to some of the theory, and then say, yeah, I do that. And mm. the benefit of you sharing I do that is then other people can go oh so it's not just me then that has these challenges or has these struggles with what we're dealing with um, so the idea really is this is a an ability to expand the knowledge amongst the the, the dive nation the community we're talking about so without further ado I will uh, share yeah, I see we've got a nice mix back of South Africans, internationals, all over the world, from the States to Europe, uh, uh, cold Cape Town, I believe, uh, Johannesburg is also quite chilly, so yeah, all right, well, there we go, uh, Gareth. Excellent, right, oh, in fact, this works then, brilliant, so side by side, uh, I've got my slides, which is, is great, so I can see me, and I can see the chat window on the right-hand side, so um, cold setting and diving. Now, this, this photo is, is one that I took in Norway, um, diving with a couple of friends of mine, James and Garth, and we'd gone to penetrate this wreck, which is, is lying on its uh, starboard side. And we were like, yeah, let's, let's go and do this. Let, let's go and, and swim in this and explore this. Now, we recognized that it, it, was, it was a place that basically wasn't dived very often. So there was likely to be a lot of particulate around because it hadn't been dislodged by divers. So we tied off some line, got a primary tire from the right-hand side, there's a secondary one uh, just before we go in. Uh, this is um, my buddy who's, um, who's actually, he's number two. The other guy is uh, there's already one person in front of him. And you can see the crud that's coming out of this uh, pet is this site that we're going through. Now, this wreck is, as I said, it's lying on its side. So the um, the gangway that we're going through, this passageway, is, is not particularly wide. It's only one person wide if it's upright. So think about it on its side. So for us, it's great because we're, we're basically now swimming and we've got plenty of space to get through. Um, but there was lots of crud. There were lots of things hanging. And I'll show you some pictures at the end of this presentation on the questions slide to basically what happened on that dive. We had a goal, and the fact that I'm here means that I got out, and, and my two buddies, uh, James and Garth, are still here as well, but we'll, uh, we'll expand a little bit more on that. We had a goal, and uh, we, we achieved it um, because the goal shifted, uh, and we recognized we needed to do that. So what I'm going to do now is, he says, let's see if I can move through this. Uh, this was the downside, actually, uh, Morn, is, here we go, right, oops, back one. There's a bit of a delay here. Right, so um, Morn's, Morn's already covered my background, so I'm not going to cover that. Uh, the only thing that's, that's in addition to what, uh, what was presented uh, was I've got a new conference starting in September, 
Uh, it's a two-day global conference online, 29 speakers over two days, um, and we're going to talk about lots of things related to human factors, but not just technical diving. It's going to cover technical open circuit, cave, rebreather, um, commercial diving, military diving, public safety diving. It's going to cover recreational diving. What, what is it to be a dive master, to be an instructor? So it's the whole facet of, uh, of, of human factors in diving, research and, and all sorts of stuff. So uh, I'll put a link for that uh, at the end, and it'll be in the resources tomorrow as well. Then I'm going to cover three stories um, uh, to, to show what goal setting is about and where the downside of goals can, can lead us to. Um, and then I'm going to interspace, intersperse those stories with a little bit of theory to, to bring it to life for you. And then the final piece is, yeah, it's, it's all well talking about the negative aspects, but what I'm going to do is give you some tools about how to set and manage goals successfully. So as I said, that you don't end up with lucky outcomes, that they're actually um, uh, more planned, intentionally successful rather than lucky successful. Uh, and then put a bit of summary and then take questions at the end. Um, but if you've got any burning questions, put them in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll go from there and uh, we'll pick them up. But after each story, I'm going to ask you to share you know, your ideas and parallels with what's going on. So the first story that's there, and this is from um, chapter four in Under Pressure. And in the same way, Mornay was, uh, was listening to his uh, you know, copy of Under Pressure and Audible, which is it's available as an audiobook. I, I've just done this recently. I, you know, I wrote the book in 2019. It was, uh, it was published in 2019. So I wrote it actually in 2018. And um, once it was published, I hadn't really sort of looked at it. Uh, I knew what I'd written, but, you know, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to listen to my book. And what I noticed was there were lots of different stories that related to goals and potentially goals that were too focused in, uh, in diving. And this was one particular one from Roger Williams. And uh, he was um, diving, he used to live in Hawaii. Uh, he's now lived out in Tulum in Mexico. He's, he's very prolific online, um, great sense of humor, um, very broad experience in, in diving, uh, technical cave and aquarium diving. And on this particular scenario is where they were diving, there was this spit of, of, of land that stuck out where they could end up entering the water or they could enter the water. Now, the difficulty is that this required a significant walk in, um, a good sort of half an hour of walking to get to uh, the, the promontory, the, this sort of spit that, that stuck out. And it's a rock area. And where these waves come in, the 7,000 miles of ocean pile against these, um, these, these rocky faces, these, these small cliffs. And so the opportunity to dive these, these sites is, is, it doesn't come around very often. But the opportunities when you're in the water are just fantastic. So they, they were driving along this sort of road one day and went, oh, man, it's, it's pretty calm. It, it looks ideal. So they, they shot off down to the dive shop, grabbed their gear, and then drove back up to the parking place. So they had to get kitted up in the, the sort of lay-by parking place um, and then walk down the road cross over the, the, the metal barrier, called it a jersey barrier, the sort of reinforced girdering, um, and then over the top, and then down this little ravine, about 30 foot ravine, to then cross under the road, and then walk down this sort of rocky path that brings you out onto the water's edge. So it's a warm day, they're um, pretty sweaty by the time they get down there. And by the time they got there, the water conditions have changed a bit. And, and Roger describes it, it was just the other side of wrong. Um, and, and so they're sitting again, oh. And they hadn't really made this discussion about making a decision. And Roger was the most experienced, and, and he made the decision for everybody else. Yeah, let's go. It's doable. And the problem is that now, as he's the most experienced senior person, he's set the example, and it makes it really difficult for anybody else to say no. So they're standing there and they get their fins on and, uh, and Roger jumps off 
the, uh, the, the, the cliff, just as basically a wave comes in, jump in so that he's then going to get taken out. Now, this is a total commitment dive because the only place you can get back out again is swimming 30 minutes along the edge to a beach where you can crawl out. So once you're in the water, that's it. There is no rescue. This is a make it happen or not. So he jumps in, fins in the hand, uh, mask on, regs in his mouth, and he jumps in and he starts sinking. And he takes a breath from the reg and there's nothing there because the cylinder hadn't been turned on. They'd been so engrossed in the decision making and the discussion about jumping off this cliff into sort of 30 meters of water, 100 feet of water, that he hadn't done his final checks. And he's in the process of trying to put his fins on because he's now got to get some form of a propulsion uh, and he's sinking. And he reaches back and he's like, I can't get this on, swaps the fins over, reaches back, and the reg is, sorry, the valve is stuck because it's some crappy rental cylinder that he's got from the shop that has basically been over tightened because it keeps leaking. So that's been jammed on and he's now trying to kick himself to the surface um, and he's gradually making his way up and he's, he describes the feeling of sitting there going, great, this is how I'm gonna die. I've just done a pretty simple activity. I've jumped off the edge of the cliff um, and I'm gonna drown here. And it's a panic. It's a very sort of rational thought process that's going on. So eventually he's, he manages to kick up and he breaks the surface and his two buddies are like, what? You're supposed to be down there. And he just, you know, the first thing he shouts once he's taken a breath of air is, make sure your air's on. It's like, yeah, okay. And they jump in and then they have an eventful swim. And in fact, it was a, you know, a really... Uh, really enjoyable dive because the underground, the underwater scenery is fantastic where the, the waves have smashed the rock faces and made sea caves and all sorts of stuff. So the underwater scenery is fantastic. But this could have so ended up as a as a disaster because the goal fixation was make it happen. Now, once they got down to the water's edge, you know, in terms of the goal setting and the fixation on it, there is this bit of... Uh, We've committed a whole bunch of time and effort walking down the hill. It's hot. It's sweaty. I don't particularly want to walk 30 minutes back up the hill to where we are and lose this opportunity. And this is one of the challenges of goal setting and maintenance or aborting from goals. So this is oh, go back to this one here. Um, what parallels can you draw from that? So this is basically um, for you to type something in the chat window. Have, have you encountered a situation like this where you've gone onto a dive and it, it's just, you want to carry on? It's much easier to carry on than abort the dive. So over to you, uh, let, let us know what you've got. All right, let's give them, uh, you know, we got a bit of a, a delay between, uh, <clears throat> say, YouTube and, and what we present, roughly oh, about 15 yeah. seconds. So we'll give them a, um, a bit of a chance. But, yeah, it is quite interesting. Uh, I, I remember uh, listening to this part in the book, and I, I was trying to reflect on that because <clears throat> in that excitement, and we just got to get out there, as you say, it's, you've just got this window of opportunity yeah, and I guess it happened to all of us, regardless of how many dives we've done, how good we are. And I guess it comes back to those checklists you always uh, like to promote, um, uh, Gary. Oh, totally. But the, the, the checklists themselves are, are, are a social activity. You know, they're a tool, but they have to be executed as part of a social process. And yeah. that checklist, you know, as the team there, as soon as Roger turned around and went, yeah, I'm going to make the decision, everybody else is like, mm. Okay, that's made yeah. it hard. And then he's so engaged in that and the inability of the others to go, uh, let's do our pre-dive checks, face-to-face -face body check and everything else like that. So now I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. hoping that, that his people are shy and not because <laughs> um, that, that they haven't had this because I'm sure there are people out there. So yeah, uh, there are yeah. two other options, uh, two other opportunities to talk about this sort of stuff. Yeah, And yeah. I get to talk about these commitments. 
Well, I don't see any uh, comments just yet, so we'll prompt them one more time. Uh, if not, then, you know, think about it, folks, and pop those uh, comments and questions you might have in the comments uh, 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 box there, and we can always get back to them. But, uh, yeah, great yeah. Uh, um, uh, story to kickstart this webinar. And, uh, yeah, especially I guess taking into account the type of dive it's not, okay, well, it's fine, we can turn around. As you say, it's a, it's a commit 100% or don't do it at all kind of uh, dive. So, yeah. <laughs> right. So let's move on to the next bit, goal setting then. Um, so this bit about, you know, start off with um, what is a goal? It, it really is something that you want to go out and achieve. Now, if you go and look at the business um, sort of media that's out there, it talks about and – uh, safety stuff and coaching and development goals are often this thing of smart make it a smart goal so it's it's specific it's measurable it's achievable it's realistic and it's timely it's like god that's difficult you know that isn't the sort of thing that you do i'm going to get out of bed in the morning and i'm going to go and do some exercise well yeah okay that's a goal but it's not really specific what we want to do is, is make things that we can hold our hands onto and say look we've achieved this or not but writing out smart goals, I've discussed previously, we're efficient creatures. We don't like spending effort and, and energy on doing sort of paperwork where we don't see a benefit. So what you could actually just say is something is, that's measurable or meaningful. So it, just two now. So I've got to basically say this goal. So if is it measurable, how do I know I've succeeded? What would be considered success? Uh, yeah, Joe, that's, that's a great one from, from the previous slide because uh, you feel committed, potentially committed to it. So, you know, in terms of the goals, it's measurable. So how do I know that I've achieved it? How do I then say if I didn't achieve it, how do I get better? And the other bit is meaningful because if it doesn't mean anything to you, then you're not going to carry on and do it. Um, so that, that meaningful is also the double-edged sword. Because actually, if it is totally important for you and you're totally committed to it, then actually you might miss other uh, cues and clues that things aren't going quite to plan. And I'll talk about in the next but one slide, talking about some of the cognitive biases that lead us to be fixated on the goal. So um, is, is the goal a, a voyage or a journey? By this... I mean, a journey is, is often a, a single step, and a journey is multiple steps. Sorry, a voyage is multiple steps to get somewhere. So what I've, um, I've described my opening and closing lectures for the Human Factors in Diving Conference as a voyage of bringing human factors into diving. It's not a journey because it's not a one-step thing. There are multiple journeys that make up this voyage. And so for you, in terms of goal setting, that could be exploring a wreck. What, the whole wreck or a little bit of it? It could be about recovering some artifacts from that wreck. It could be about surveying a reef. or It could be undertaking a photogrammetry project. Or it could be about passing a class. Now, passing a class, to me, is, is a journey rather than a voyage. Because the class should contribute to what's going on. So for me, you know, my goal is, is to bring human factors into the diving industry. That's a huge thing. That's a voyage. So I've got a whole bunch of training programs, education programs, incident reporting, webinars, all sorts of things like this that help me on the journey. Um, when I went through my diver training, I was interested in doing deep wreck photography. So I did a lot of top side photography. I knew how to use the camera properly on the surface. And then I started developing my training, my in-water competence by doing fundamentals. So I had a, a GB fundamental, so I had a stable platform. I then did Tech 1, normoxic trimix, so I could do 30-meter, 100-foot diving without thinking about the diving. I built technical competence so I could do photography. I then did the advanced trimix class, Tech 2, so I could do normoxic trimix without thinking about it. And now I've just recertified back on the JJCTR with GUE. I'm back at square one again now. I've got to rebuild my competencies on the rebreather 
before I pick the camera back up again. So the goals are about developing my competencies as a voyage, and there are little steps that are going on in that. So I'm achieving goals as I go along. Oops. Um, the other bit about in, in terms of diving is, is it an individual goal to develop myself or is it a team goal? Uh, now, it might be you go into a class as a team of some friends and you want to pass together. So now you're going to work together to achieve this. But it also means that the team can help you bring each other on. But it can also say, uh, that's enough. And, and as a team, you can make better decisions as long as you've got a, a psychologically safe environment to basically call it if need be. Um, next bit. Uh, what is considered success? Now, I... Um, one of my other roles is the director for quality control and risk management for uh, GUE. So I see the quality control forms that come in for all the classes. And one of the interesting things here is people um, are often focused or sometimes focused on passing the class as opposed to developing themselves individually. So the success is I get a tech pass or I, I get the, the certification. Whereas actually a better goal would be about furthering my education and a byproduct of that is the certification that goes with it because the mindset is slightly different that's there. We're talking about a growth mindset rather than a finite mindset. And then at what cost are you willing to achieve these goals? Um, now, if this is business it's you're gonna, uh, and you're working in a business, how much of your personal life your family life are you willing to sacrifice? If it's the diving world, how much of your family life, personal life, are you willing to sacrifice to go and get your reward, which is about being underwater? Um, how much money are you willing to sacrifice? Um, how much time? All of these things have got a cost that's associated with them. And every time we have a risk, there is, you know, if there is a reward, there's going to be a downside at some point because we have to pay for it in some form or another. So, next story. Um, and this relates to the 1996 Everest disaster in which eight people died in a single day uh, whilst summiting uh, or trying to summit on Everest. And that included two world-class Himalayan mountain guides. Uh, and it nearly included a, a third one, which I was listening to a podcast today about. Um, and the, the premise here is that, you know, this is a, a, a huge undertaking. It's a massive business. And in fact, I think last year there were some pictures of tens, hundreds of people queuing at Hillary's step, which is the choke point to get to the summit of Everest, because it has become a huge tourist business. And it's a really expensive tourist business. It's in the order of $70,000 just to get a license to climb. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get to the top. It just gives you permission to go and climb. So in this case here, there were a number of um, companies running expeditions to summit on, in, in May 1996. And as they were making their way up the mountain, it had forecast originally to be pretty clear. Um, and then unfortunately, as they were getting to a committed point, the weather was rolling in and it wasn't expected. Uh, they set off at sort of midnight to do the final summit push from camp four up to the top. And as they started to go up, they were basically given a deadline that said, if you haven't reached this point here on the mountain by two o'clock in the afternoon, you have to turn around because the storm's gonna come in and you're gonna be stuck on the mountain um, and you're not likely to survive as a consequence or you'd, you'd be pretty lucky if you did. So they were making their way up and the, the way that the organizations were set up, you would have two guides, you'd have a, a sort of a, the lead guide would be the guy at the back and then you'd have the, the sort of the, the leader that basically would set the pace to make sure that people would stay together. Um, and unfortunately, they were really struggling. Uh, and one of Rob Fisher's uh, expedition never made that point in, in time. But there was this sort of social commitment. Um, there were friends, there were um, relationships that were involved. That basically, they pushed to the summit. They got summit fever. Uh, and the storm blew in. And 
eight people ended up dying on the mountain that night uh, and, and the following day because they were just stuck and they couldn't make their way down. In fact, uh, the guy who I was talking to, uh, sorry, listening to this afternoon, um, he, he led uh, uh, Beck Waters down and he was snow blind. So actually had one of his Japanese clients and um, Beck, the, the Japanese client died on the mountain. Beck made it back just, but he was horribly frostbitten and was snow blind and had to literally be led hand down through this mountain. Now, in hindsight, it's really easy to see how powerful and potent these goals are. Um, and, and you can sit there and go, why would you do that? That that It was obvious that that was going to end in disaster, but it's not. And in fact, the, the, the podcast, and I'll put a link in, in the show notes, it was just a, a quick 10-minute piece. He got asked the question by the interviewer and said, would you do it again? You know, considering there were eight people died in that day and day and a half period, um, and then another four people died else uh, at another time, uh, at other times in that same season. So 12 people had died in the 1996 season. And the, and the interviewer said, would you do it again? And he went, yeah, of course. That's what's out there. It's a risky business, but the rewards are fantastic. And this was a perfectly run expedition until the point the wheels came off the, the wagon really quickly, really catastrophically, and there wasn't really a way of um, uh, recovering the situation. And, and that's, you know, dangerous activities. But there's a huge reward that's associated with that. So there's there's a number of books that that listed with this. Into Thin Air by John Krakow is one, uh, and this book here by uh, Christopher Keyes. He talks about this concept of destructive goal pursuit, which is where the target, the goal of what you're trying to do, clouds the leadership and the team pressures. Summit fever, exploration fever. Artifact fever, recovery, you know, a colleague of mine, Guy Shock, he's one of my instructors. He's a, a GUE instructor as well. And when he talks about why people go out there diving, it's like, oh, it's pirate's gold. Let's go and find a new wreck. And in fact, he's setting up some stuff later this year about wreck exploration, going to find some new uh, marks, find out what they are, identify them, see what is there, put a purpose towards the dive. But recognizing that purpose has to be tempered by the associated risks. So, oops, I'm gonna go back to this next bit. I'm gonna flip between these two screens. We've sort of another story here. What are your parallels? So what sort of summit fever or dive fever or exploration fever you've had in diving? That might be about undertaking a class. It might be about being a, uh, a reef, taking photos. Um, it could be, you know, running out of gas because you've been so focused on getting that shot. That's a goal. Or it could be about trying to recover an artifact. And in fact, a friend of mine died 11 years ago now, trying to recover an anchor on behalf of a friend who'd given up, given up diving. And unfortunately, it cost him his life because he ran out of gas at 60 meters, 200 feet, and was so fixated on what was going on, didn't go to his buddy who was in front of him, and irrationally, in hindsight, made a bolt to the surface and went from 60 meters, 200 feet to the surface in about 120 seconds um, with about 30 minutes of uh, decompression overhead. So massive gas embolisms, um, large internal organ damage, and even though the skipper brought him on the boat, got him off and tried to give him CPR, uh, they called a helicopter, took him to the hospital, and he was dead on arrival. Um, so uh, I use it, and the problem is he's such a nice guy. And it, the difficulty of trying to tell a story about a really nice guy is people go, oh, you're putting his memories down. I'm like, no, it's not at all. I'm rationalizing his decision making based on the goals and the processes that were involved. So has anybody else had artifact fever, exploration fever, picture fever? We've got a lot of good good divers on here. 
Yeah. So, um, uh, Gareth, <coughs> Gareth, um, uh, Joe, um, posted, uh, you know, this, um, thing on your <coughs> screen there that was from the first story, you know, where, you know, he's on a boat feeling seasick and, uh, you know, still going diving, uh, regardless, you know, so, uh, I guess, uh, getting down in there, but, um, so yeah, there's a couple of reasons uh, expanding on that one for Joe. You know, the thing is, and we'll talk about some of the biases that are in, involved in this. And the first one on the next slide is something called sunk cost fallacy, which is that, you know, we're committed. Most people are, I'm going to say, more time poor than money poor. Um, you know, especially those in, in sort of temperate environments where the weather is a bit unpredictable. Um, and so it might be you're blown out three or four weekends in a row. And you're on this trip, it's out to a really nice wreck, um, and you've paid a bunch of money to go on the boat. You've got a bunch of gas in the back in, in your cylinders that you're ready to go. Um, you're diving as a pair, which means that if you don't dive, your buddy doesn't dive because they don't solo. And there isn't anybody else that they can buddy up with. So there are a bunch of reasons. And understanding those, excuse me, those drivers really important um so i'll tell a good story then uh so which was talking about this sort of commitment so the guy i was doing some diving with today at a, an inland uh, dive site he's um going back out to a wreck next week that they visited last week and he was he, he found a, a porthole that was just sitting there intact with cover with glass it's like awesome this is brilliant you know get the and unfortunately he hadn't brought his lift bag with him on this dive so they tried to use four large surface marker boys to lift this thing and um three of them escaped the line snapped so there's now three surface marker boys shot to the surface and the skipper's like what's this all about so they were trying to find other ways of, of lifting this thing and then he realized that he was getting sucked into reward. And, and it was just this, this total fixation on, we've got to get this out. And he's like, yeah. no. The deco's building up. The, 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 the marker boys are on the surface. What the hell's the skipper going to think about what's going on? So he called it. He's, he's, he's marked where it is, so he knows. And that's why they're going back next week to go and recover it. Um, but he knows where that is. But he had he was recognized that he was getting sucked into the goal of recovering this artifact, called time, and then made the ascent. But they he's he's made it better for him the next time because yeah. he's set the conditions to make it more successful. So no, no more stories. We'll, we'll move on. Go on, Molly. We can say Yeah, no, I was just thinking, you know, I guess uh, uh, that's really why it's important to have goals and that everybody is aware of them. So that when you find yourself getting sucked into um, uh, that particular situation you mentioned now, at least you've got a trigger you can refer back to and say, hang tight, uh, things aren't going the way they should. Uh, let's yeah. kind of uh, focus and get back on track again. Totally. And talking of which, we'll move on to the next slide. <laughs> so um, a number of, of, of biases that, that cloud our decision making that's going on and are already touched on one of these of, of sunk cost fallacy. The more we invest in something, the harder it is to say no. So if you have a, um, you get to the dive site, you get to the, the pier um, the, where you're, you're putting on the boat, the key side, and you notice that a bit of kit's broken. Um, and you think, yeah, it's okay. Uh, and you put, you put the, the, the equipment on the boat because you think, well, we've got an hour and a half, two hours to go out to the dive site. It's be time to quickly field service my kit and, and it'll be ready by the time we get there. The problem is the closer you get to the dive site, the harder it becomes because you're getting more and more committed to the activity. And then, you know, you get out to the dive site, you can look over the back of the boat and you can see the shot line goes down, you know, 20, 30 meters. And you're like, wow, this is awesome, Viz, but you still haven't resolved your kit properly. And it's something that's sort of marginal. It's not like a total catastrophic failure. It's something that you might be able to carry. And in fact, you are going to carry it because the reward is better than not the risk, you know, the, the downside of it. So the closer you get to the commitment time, 
the harder it is to say no. And this is where it's quite good having standards and, um, and expectations amongst as a team, because then actually you can turn around and go, you know what, I'm going to call the dive for you because that's not an acceptable failure that we can carry because something else might happen and things can cascade because accidents and incidents don't um, normally happen as a single catastrophic failure. They're normally uh, an aggregation of numerous factors. So the next one is uh, availability bias. So if I don't know this sort of thing happens, it doesn't come into my decision making. So I, I often talk about risk and uncertainty. Risk management is, uh, my, my, my view of this, risk management is about quantitative analysis based on the numbers you've got and the, the losses and the gains. In diving, we don't have that. What we're dealing with here is uncertainty, and that's about biases and heuristics, mental shortcuts. If we don't have something that says, you know, in our memory, our experiences that says, this could go wrong, we don't think it does. And people go, well, that's really simplistic. And you go, yeah, well, our brains are pretty simplistic like that. Um, conversely, I'm more risk aware. I'm not risk averse because I read and do a lot of this stuff about things going wrong. Hindsight bias. Ah, oh, easy to say afterwards what went wrong. Um, but in real time, we don't know how the dots are going to join and how they fan out in the future. Um, afterwards, we can see that they were totally fixated on those goals and they weren't paying attention to what's going on. But in real time, we're unaware of that unless we've got those standards and expectations. And I'll come on to some of the tools to help us. Um, overconfidence. Uh, I'm going to say this is another double-edged sword. Overconfidence is how we develop and how we teach divers, children to develop in the world. Go on, give it a go. You're going to stretch yourself. You're going to get better. That, and you believe in yourself. You think, yeah, great, I can do that. It's a good thing to ha have because it allows exploration and development to have it, to happen. Sorry, it allows exploration and development to happen because you're going to push beyond what you believe to be safe. But has anybody seen any of the presentations I've given before? What we need to do is create a system or systems that allow us to fail safely. So when we do fail, and we will, we fail in a safe way. Um, Dunning-Kruger effect, you don't know what you don't know, and even worse, you don't know that you don't know. So it's slightly different to overconfidence because it's not about um, my confidence in my ability to do something, it's just my knowledge. I don't have the knowledge of the situation. And as a consequence, I don't know that what I'm doing is a wrong thing. Um, and, and there's a whole bunch of work, and in fact, the presentation if you want to look at this, is Tech Dive USA 16 on my Vimeo channel. It talks about the Dunning Kruger effect. And, and the title of the presentation is Incompetent and Unaware. Uh, normalization of deviance, which is where we end up um, accepting um, substandard actions and then carrying on because things didn't go wrong uh, in the past. And we set a standard and we move on. We set a standard and we move on. And we are unaware of how far we are drifting from safety until afterwards. And we can see that things go wrong. And then we can apply hindsight bias and go, oh, that was obvious. So there are a bunch of cognitive biases that, that limit um, our ability to see what's going on. So it's not just about our internal thought processes. We also have something called um, uh, tensions within a system. So this comes from work by Jens Rasmussen talking about the, the difference or the, the tensions between safety, which is the red line, uh, economic failure, which is basically how much money we've got, uh, and workload, how much effort we're willing to do or put into this. Now, it's, it's developed around organizations, uh, but it applies to individuals and teams. So what we have to start with, get my uh, cursor. We've got, you know, this line here, it's failure. This is where we have an accident. But this is what we consider to be our safe margin, our, our sort of safe boundary that's going on here. Um, now, the difficulty is we never know where this solid red line is, because if we did, we would never have an accident. What we do is we, we play to this bar boundary of, uh, of error, this margin of error, and we hope that this line is not the same, you know, the dotted line is not the same as the red line. Now, 
frustrating me. So there's the error margin. Where's my mouse gone? Right, move on and see if that works there. Right. There we go. Right. So moving on. There we go. So what we try to do, we're efficient creatures individually as businesses we're trying to be as efficient or teams we're trying to be as efficient as possible uh, so as we, we are being more efficient we're getting away from the the sort of the failure so we, uh, in, in terms of workload so we're trying to make things work now that means that we're pushing ourselves towards unsafety we talk you know towards that that boundary of, of an accident at the same time we also have saving money and divers are some of the tightest people out there when it comes to spending money. Unless it's shiny, and then you can find all the money down the back of the sofa, and you can find it to buy all the bits of gear. Um, but if that gear breaks, you're not necessarily going to go out and service it. And, and we have another cognitive bias that basically says, if it didn't go wrong the last time, it's fine. So yeah, it might leak a bit, or it might bubble a bit, it's okay. So we have these tensions that are pushing money and workload towards unsafety. And then we have safety campaigns uh, in a business that's there, but it's, you know, it's the stuff that I do. It's not necessarily a campaign, it's about the education process that's trying to push the, the, the sort of the, the performance back away from the error margins and, and the accident lines that are there. So we've got to look at how much are you willing to lose? Be that money, time, or losing a dive, might be a wreck. And the one on the left-hand side was from the same trip. It's up in Norway. The one on the right-hand side is some cavern diving in Mexico. There's a lot of time and money went into those two trips. And you see going, how much am I willing to compromise to get there? Now, there's, there's a quote uh, from Duncan McKillop that I talk about. If we are constantly gambling. We never know with 100% certainty what the outcome is going to be. So we gamble a small number of certainties against the million possibilities that are out there and say, I think that's what we'll do. Uh, and we, we take those risks, but unless we reflect on it, we're not necessarily going to learn from this. Now, this is where uh, behavioral economics, economists um, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Sversky, they won the Nobel Prize for Behavioral Economics based on this thing called prospect theory, of which we have an idea of how much we're willing to lose and how much we're willing to gain and what that means to us in a subjective value. Um, now, what they pointed out as well is this, this how much we are willing to trade off revolves around an anchor point. So what you could say is, if I flip a coin and heads, I, you know, basically you can win or lose a dollar. Now, how much are you willing to bet to, to get some, uh, to, to get a win back? And you sit there going, well, I'm, I'm happy to flip it and it, it's a dollar. It doesn't matter. Now I'll go to two, $10. What about $50? What about $100? What about $500? So we're going to flip a coin you could win or lose $500. How much are you willing to bet against that? And what we're saying is, how much are you willing to win versus lose? And what we found is that you would need to go to between one and a half and two and a half times before you're willing to lose the original baseline point. So for to win, you know, to, to not lose $500, you'd want to win $1,500 to two and a half thousand dollars. That's what most people win. So what we're saying is that as we move up, we, if we're in a losing situation, or losses have bigger subjective values than gains. Now, think about when you go diving in the context of immediate and delayed losses as well. So I'm willing to um, accept a, a guaranteed minor loss. So that might be, sorry, I'm willing to accept a potential major loss in the future 
compared to a guaranteed minor loss. And the example here is you get off the back of the boat with a piece of equipment that's not 100% working. Now that could end up with you being dead because of a failure mode later on. Now that's a potential risk. But if I don't get off the back of the boat, it's a guaranteed loss, albeit it's me not going diving. So that's a minor loss that's guaranteed versus a major loss in the future. So we have to look at this and what we are willing to, to, to lose is based around this center point. If somebody dives every day of the week and they have a bit of equipment fails, it doesn't really matter if they miss that dive out. But if you're in a situation where you haven't dived for a month because the weather's rubbish, you've got this opportunity and then you're committed for the next three weekends, you will take a greater risk on that weekend's worth of diving than you would have done if you'd been able to dive all eight weeks from there. Understanding our shifting um, perception of risk and benefit is critical if we want to know how to make better decisions going forward. So this goes to, which leads then to the final story, which is the title of a blog that's on the human dive and it's written by one of my instructors, Guy Shockey, that talks about is the juice, juice worth the squeeze? And in which he was running an advanced Trimix class. Now he's based in Vancouver Island. The Trimix class was it's a closed circuit rebreather class as well. Um, so he was running the class in Mexico. A couple of people had flown in. They were bright people. They run their own businesses. They had to um, sacrifice family holiday so that they could undertake this class. So the family came out. They did their family stuff while these guys did their training. And on the second day, there was some technical issues with one of the guys rebreathers and that technical issue only showed itself when they were at depth so they'd gone down and this issue showed up and it's like oh this doesn't look right so they aborted the dive they drove back to the dive center which is an hour's drive from the dive site to the dive center they did some servicing and then they basically did some more theory and then the following day they got back in now they're already half a day or so behind the course. It's only six days long, so there's not a lot of margin in there, and they've got a fixed holiday time. So they get back down to depth, and this fault reproduces itself. And they're like, yeah, what? Now, it's not a catastrophic failure. It's a, it's a, it's a, an, a, a pain in the what's it, but it does compromise the safety margins. So they fund the dive, they get back up, and they go back to the dive center. Uh, and they, they try and resolve it. And, and the guy whose equipment has been failed is saying, that's oh, okay. We, you know, we could press on, we could compress this stuff. Now they're now a day and a half into a six day course. That means that, you know, they're well behind the schedule and they're not going to get the quality of the training that's there because there are multiple skills and drills and consolidation that's needed. Now the instructor was well within his rights to call it. But actually, the students did. Or in fact, it was the buddy. So the guy who was got his broken kit was going, look, let's try it a bit more. Let's try it a bit more. And his buddy went, eh, no, that's not what we do. Here's the standards, the expectations. We're going we're, we're gonna to knock this on the head. We're going to have some fun diving back at the level where we were, you know, the normal exit class, get some consolidation once we've resolved whatever the free breather issue is, and then we'll reschedule the class later. Now, that costs them money time but they were willing to sacrifice that against the potential of a catastrophic failure that could have ended up going horribly wrong um, now let's say the instructor basically turned around guy said i could have thumbed it but i was much better that the students owned it and came up with the decision themselves uh, so I'm not going to go parallel because nothing happened on the last one. So, and, and I know we've got at an hour, and I'm going to. I've got one, two more slides, and then we've got Q and A. So, this is the the tools to help you. Uh, and you might might wonder why I've got a World War Z um, zombie image. I'll, I'll come up to that in one of the last comments that's there. So, um, and I lost the thing again. 
<laughs> so, um, and, and you touched on this right at the start, uh, Monet, with uh, this clarity of goal and success criteria. This is what really the brief should be about. Understand what's the purpose of this dive and what's the criteria to end it. And that might be maximum bottom time, maximum decompression, minimum gas. Um, it could be about running out of battery, running out of, you know, there is going to be some point on that dive that says, this is a non-negotiable. And you've got to be very clear within the team what are non-negotiable ends to a goal. Because that empowers the team members to go, we're going up. But, but, but we're going up. Here's the criteria. And that could be whatever it is. But you've made it clear from the outset. So that helps with psychological safety. Um, briefings to include biases and decision points, which is linked with the, the bit above, but it, it's being very specific. And it's also recognizing, and I, I had um, a talk with uh, an organization, project leader, just last week, where they were doing some, some fairly hefty work. There was a high workload dive. And the, the, the diver who was doing the, the workload hadn't realized how hard he was working and ended up getting a, a, a CO2 hit, hypercapnia. Um, and they changed their procedures now because they realized that the person who was, should be making the decision or had been making the decision, which was the, the diver who's working, is not the person to make that decision. It's the observer diver, the safety diver, who can see what's going on, who can then has got clarity He's not working very hard and can help things. So, and they now brief that as part of the pre-dive uh, brief. Um, create, maintain psychological safety. And there's a whole there's a series of four blogs on the human diver uh, blog, which talks about how to uh, create and, or develop, maintain high performance teams. And psychological safety is critical to that, uh, which we go from inclusion to learner safety, to contribute safety, to challenger safety, which is the, the most important bit as far as I'm concerned. You can thumb a dive at any time for any reason, um, but that will only happen if you've got psychological safety or there is an imminent threat to life. The difficulty with the imminent threat to life is you may be too late to recover the situation. Um, how can you fail safely? So this is about looking at contingencies and have you validated those? Yeah, yeah, we've got oxygen on the boat. Really? When was the last time you checked it? Uh, what about rescue cover? What about phone cover? What about all sorts of things that are there that you have built into your uh, emergency or immediate action plan, but do you know that those things work? How many people have gone and done a rescue weekend to look at people's rescue skills? Um, I know when I ran one oh, probably about five, six years ago, it was a really interesting experience when it came to using the easy cut Z knives, um, because what we found is that if that's the webbing, and I basically sacrificed my one piece harness webbing, at like 12 quid, it's like fine, we cut the harness off, it, we can use it as a training experience. And what happened is when my, my harness strap was here and the guy was basically using the Z knife, so I'm gonna put it there, instead of doing it like this, where it was parallel or perpen, you know, it basically runs that way, what was happening is he was pulling it this way and the webbing wasn't being caught on the cutting it cutting surface so he's doing this and nothing was happening so it was a really good experience to say you know what we got these tools but we don't necessarily know how they work so be able to fail safely so validate your contingency plans then after the dive look at how things were successful and what were the pressures that led us to make some of the decisions we did uh, so we can be more aware of them the next time around. The goal of debriefs is to learn from that last dive so that the next dives are um, safer, really. Um, and this is where the World War Z thing comes up, is a, an Israeli concept called the 10th man. Um, I've done some training and developing myself through a company called Red Team Thinking, and they've taken these concepts of red teaming uh, brought them into and developed them into a uh, simple way of looking at this. And the idea here is you have somebody who's there as a constructive dissenter. 
their role, and in fact, everybody should be in the organization that does this, but the way the Israelis do it is they identify a particular person and it is their role to pick holes in the plan. And they're not doing it because they're an idiot or being a real pain in the what's it. They're doing it because they need to find the holes in their plans. And they rotate that 10th man around. And the idea about this red team thinking or red teaming is to have the mindset that says, this plan will have flaws in it because it's based on assumptions. What are the assumptions we're using and how do we go about validating them? What are the ones that we don't need to worry about? What are the critical ones? So mm. that again links in with psychological safety. How do you validate the plans you've got? And then the final one is nearly all of this is based around leadership as a verb as opposed to being a leader as a noun. You don't have to hold a title to be a leader um, with you know to demonstrate leadership within a team. So you could actually be leading when you're a junior or subordinate person. It's the activities that you do that we're talking about. And that's one of the, the areas that I do in terms of my uh, of the training and the education that I deliver. Which then brings me on to um, what I do to help others. So the, the essentials microclass, which is talking about two and a half hours or so online. Um, I've had so much positive feedback and, and it sets a baseline. And by the end of July, there'll be a new version of that comes out. And if you've got the existing class, you'll get the new one as, uh, as I update it. Um, 10 week webinar based training, that's week six has just finished now. The next edition will be in September time. Um, and I'm also gonna run a 10 week program looking at the book under pressure and a chapter at a time. So you can listen to the audio book and then we'll each week We'll have a coaching session where people can bring their ideas and insights and I will describe the key themes. And the idea is you can learn from each other because I don't know everything. You will bring some insights into the community that we can learn from. Two day face to face courses, which has been on hold for the last 18 months or so, although some of my instructors have managed to get programs up and running. Um, the book, which I'm um, always talked about, uh, if only I would really, um, if you haven't seen it, Go and watch the video. It's 34 minutes. If you're an instructor or a dive center manager or anybody in a supervisory role, and in fact, if you work in a high-risk industry, go and watch this. It will talk about how an adverse event, a fatality occurred, not because of some stupid error of which you could just turn around and go, well, he didn't turn his oxygen cylinder on, and it was a genuine oxygen cylinder as a rebreather. It was not a media oxygen cylinder. There are multiple factors that lead into this. And the video was used by a power utility in the States for their annual safety conference, um, their, their sort of safety week. And it went out to five and a half thousand people. I modified some of the narrative to meet their environment, but the story stayed the same. Uh, next is the blogs, loads of those there. And the conference, which was announced uh, about three weeks ago, uh, happens 24th, 25th of September, all online, uh, and the details uh, are on the, or I'll send those out in the resources as well, and nearly everything I've got is on humandiver.com. So, um, summary, there we go. Goals, they're really useful, definitely. They allow you to do stuff, but they've got a, a dark side that we've got to be aware of. And that's really based around the constraints and being clear to each other what the constraints are so that people can thumb the dive, end the, 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 the task, whatever it is, you know, so you know what it is before you enter. Because if you don't have that clarity, you then struggle with sunk cost fallacy because nobody wants to, to end it because you've, you've got, you know, you, you're eating into your margins and, and your rewards are getting closer in time. Um, feedback, running a debrief um, is essential because what we're trying to do is reflect on what happened. Uh, and that's hard. And for debriefs to be effective, you've got to have psychological safety, which is the bit here. Is any, anyone call a dive at any time for any reason without question. Uh, and if you're in a sort of get on the boat, people go, what do you do thumb that for? You know, we are having a great time. Well, actually, I wasn't happy. I felt scared. <laughs> Man up fine, I'm not diving with you again, then it's as simple as that, you know. But that might be the only people you dive with. Well, you've now got to make a, a risk-reward decision about 
the, your, where is your threshold? What is acceptable or not? And that's not easy. Um, and then plan to fail safely, really, is, is this bit about you will fail at some point. Um, and what you've got to determine is how can we fail safely? What are the systems and processes and skills and techniques and resources you've got in place that says when the failure happens, we end up with somebody being scared as opposed to somebody being dead? Um, and people go, oh, that's really dramatic. Yeah, well, unless you've got gills and you run out of air underwater, you're a badly placed. So think about how you can manage those failures. <laughs> And then, whoops, I'll go back to, I went a little bit fast. Um, we did make it out. Um, okay, this is this is the wreck uh, in Norway. The, the, the image in the top right uh, is me taking a picture inside one of the passageways. So I said it was, you know, it's right lying on its side. Um, those fins that were in front of me were only about 12 inches in front. It's a really wide angle lens. Um, and the vis was absolutely shocking. Uh, and we got in, and we're basically three people in a train inside this passageway. And the guy at the front was having to negotiate cables and stuff that was hanging down. And he just went, no, even though we've got a line. That, so we had to reverse back out this passageway. I was first out. So I set myself up, made sure everyone was out. And this is the amount of crud that came out as we were reversed out. So... Um, it then settled because there was a, a halocline, thermocline in the water, and, and where this this then set as a thin layer of crud in the water that marked where we were. Mm. So that is, if I can say, questions, and I'll stop sharing. So questions. Well, all right. So uh, <clears throat> I see um, we've got a couple of comments while we wait for folks to uh, um, you know, ask their questions. Um, Eve, I guess, yeah, I guess the uh, presentation uh, will be available via the uh, Dan Southern Africa YouTube channel. So you'll also receive an email with a replay link so you can uh, have a look at that. Uh, we got Harry, uh, he says, excellent review of our risk analysis, decision making skills needed, constant dynamic improvements. And, you know, just from my side, Gareth, insightful and exciting energetic as always thank you man it was it was really great <laughs> no, that's cool. All right, uh, to that point jerry it, it is something you know I, I gave a presentation eurotech in 2018 um where i talked about uncertainty versus risk mm. and uh, what i've tried to do with all of the work that i'm saying is not forget risk management um because you have to have this process you know there will be some forms and things like you're filling in, but change your attitude towards it. Mm. The risk management process should be about increasing the certainty in what the outcomes you are looking for are going to happen. So, and that could be contingency operations. So let's look at how certain am I that the contingency plan that I've got works? When was the last time you did a rescue and a lift of a casualty from depth? Yeah. Oh, I haven't. Okay, so how do you know? If you're a rebreather diver, when was the last time you did a full bailout from depth? Oh, well, that means I'm going to have to use the, the, the gas that's in my open, you know, my cylinders, my stage cylinders. Yeah. Okay. Now, that's a contingency that needs to be practiced because the reason you've bailed out is probably because the proverbial is hit the fan and something has gone wrong. Your stress will be elevated. And you won't be clear, won't be thinking as clearly as you normally would, like in a training scenario. So you have to be able to revert to these skills without thinking too much about them. And that only happens with perfect practice. You practice it, you get feedback, and you get better. All right. Well, there's a... Uh... Derek, okay. So would you call it that the first barrier fail or do risk assessment at that point, setting new goals? So it's a really, uh, a really good question. Now, that the, the Swiss cheese model, which is, is, comes from James Reason, was actually about barriers that are developed at different layers within the system. So you would have an organizational layer, and there'd be some processes in there, and they'd have holes. And then you'd have a supervisory layer, and they'd have holes as well because you're human. And then you'd have holes of 
my individual layer, what I set myself up for or as success or failure. Uh, and then you would look at um, the, the slips, laps, violations and mistakes as, as the active failures that go on. So that, that's, you know, you can look at that. That's, that's how you would look at it at an organization level and potentially an incident level. What you can look at in your scenario there, Derek, is, okay, if this item is compromised, what are the consequences? And I can't give you a, an answer. Would you call it the first barrier? Now, that could be I'm doing a, a rebreather dive, and I do my pause neg check on the loop, and it goes when I'm supposed to be doing a positive check, and it's like, I ain't getting in the water for that. But if I have something like an SPG that's bubbling, I'd probably get in the water with that because it's a high-pressure hose that's got a really tiny hole in it, and whilst it's at high pressure at you know 200 bar, the volume that goes through that hose is almost nothing. Um, so, so in effect, the second bit is do a risk assessment at that point. And the risk assessment that most people will deal with is what's happened in the past? Can I relate to it? So we're not doing a formal risk assessment. What we're doing is pattern matching against previous decisions and outcomes and then saying, what's, what am I going to do next? So we're trying to uh, increase the certainty of understanding the future. So it's not really a risk assessment per se. It's about can I relate to something in the past? And the difficulty is here, if you've never encountered it before, you will make a best fit, a best guess. You hope it's right. And in knowledge-based performance, which is where we're talking about here, the error rates are about one in, one in two, one in 10. So 50-50 to one in 10, they're not great odds. Yeah. So I hope you answered that one for you, Derek. And yeah. I'll wait for you to come in. <laughs> Yeah, well, while we wait for some more questions, I'm just going to uh, make this uh, QR code available again. This is for um, Gareth's Human Factors in Diving, that uh, micro or essentials uh, course. You can scan that uh, QR code. It'll take you straight to his website, and that's where you can find all the details. And uh, if you haven't done it yet, I think it's worthwhile. Go for it. Give a, a, a purchase it and uh, sit back and enjoy it. And then um, if you're looking uh, to purchase his book, um, you can also scan that QR code under pressure. It'll take you straight to the website. You can read up about it and uh, you can purchase it directly from his website. So let me have a look. So, Seems like we've got a... Yeah, so just a bit on that, Molly. I have yeah. um, not a particularly successful rate in posting books to South Africa in terms of them getting lost. So if okay. you're in South Africa, I'd recommend getting a Kindle copy or an Audible copy. Um, mm. Or if you've got a reliable, I don't know if Amazon reliably ships to uh, South Africa, um, I would use another source. So whilst I, I would love it if you could buy the, you know, the book from me and I could sign it and I could send it off, I've mm. got a pretty high failure rate when it comes to posting books because I can't track them. Even after I put international tracking on, it tracks mm. it when it leaves the UK, and then that's it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Get a digital copy. Yeah, good advice. Um, in fact, uh, the, the audio versions, you can, as you say, and uh, Audible, I even found it on the, um, uh, the Apple bookstore, so that's available there. So, yeah, great stuff. Well, Derek says thank you. Uh, Greg Dressel, he also says thank you uh, for diving and for life, I assume, uh, the presentation. So thanks for that, Greg. Um, well, it seems like that's it, uh, Gareth. I don't see any other questions coming in from my side. Thank you for your time. Great presentation. Um, and, yeah, I just see some, uh, some more uh, thank you. Excellent presentation. Yeah. All right. Well, any parting words from your side, Gareth, before we say cheers and call it a night? So the, the only thing I would say is the conference. Have a look on that uh, on the yeah. website. That's on the front page of The Human Diver as well. Um, some great speakers. And that's running 24th and 25th of September. And it's intentionally a Friday and a Saturday because I know people will probably want to go diving on the Sunday. Uh, so I've taken a work day and Saturday, uh, and then people can have a Sunday as well. So um, And if you've ever got any questions about any of the stuff that I'm raising, stick it in the chat of the, the Facebook group where these are all coming up, or if it's on the YouTube comments, uh, I'll pick those up, or you can find me on the Human Diver and send me a contact. 
and uh, more than happy to help anybody. All right. Well, thank you for that from my side. Uh, thanks for all the folks that joined us this evening. Um, most of uh, the references that uh, Gareth spoke about will be in the follow-up email tomorrow. So the conference link will be there, his blog link, all the uh, social media handles, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, keep a lookout for that. And, uh, yeah, if you've got time, join that conference. It, uh, it'll be a, a cracker. Um, loads of great speakers lined up and um, yeah, you'll walk away um, having a lot of knowledge uh, um, bagged after that weekend. So there we go, Robert. Thank you for the presentation. Gave me something to think about for my next projects. Okay, well, great stuff. From my side, thank you very much, everybody, for supporting uh, Dan, uh, the webinars, Gareth, and so forth. Until uh, the next webinar, good night.